Good evening, everyone. It is on. Good. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bill Swainson, and I'm a trustee of LitFest. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here for tonight's gala reading, which will be emceed by the poet Hannah Lowe, who read earlier today. And um, just to say a little bit about um, LitFest and how this evening will work. So LitFest um, is uh, f funded partly by local council um, grant, partly by an Arts Council England grant, um, particularly for this partic uh, project, and for the digital poetry map to which many of you will have contributed. Um, and it's also uh, supported by local companies. And most important of all, so this mosaic of funding is completed by our audiences. So thank you all for that as well. Um, this is the last event of our Poetry Day. And for the last, I'm just trying to think how many years it is. For the last three years, this is, we have been doing um, digital poetry projects with a, with a map in the spring um, for the March Festival and a mosaic, which is a way of indexing the poems for National Poetry Day in the autumn. And um, we always try and do a, a, a live reading. But in recent years, that's become live in person and online. And this year, um, we have 15 readers, of whom uh, three, the first three will be children from local schools who've all been contributed poems to the map. I'm very glad to say that one of them is here to read her own poem, and Hannah will introduce her at the right moment. And then Hannah will read the poems by the other two children. So there'll be five sets of three. Um, in between times, there will be, um, Hannah will read some of her own poems, poems by other poets on the theme of histories, whether personal or public. Um, and we will make our way through. The, the unusual thing about this evening is that normally we have a balance of about two-thirds in person to one-third video. And tonight the proportion has reversed. So we have one-third, that is four readers, in person. And um, the rest will be videos. But the feeling of a, a gala reading will still be here. And the whole um, event will be knitted together consummately by Hannah Lowe, uh, <laughs> to whom I'm now going to <laughs> hand over the stage. And um, please give her a very warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's a bit of a different skill set. Um, MCing an event, although I have to say, when I hear the word MCing, I think of people rapping over like dance music at raves in the 1990s, which I won't be doing, <laughs> but I will just be trying to uh, keep things running, I guess. Um, and I'm very glad to be able to uh, host this evening. Um, I think Bill has mainly explained the shape of the evening. Um, just to say about the poets that will we'll be hearing from both on video and in person. I read 128 poems last week from people that had contributed to the kind of digital histories map. And um, it was a great pleasure to select from those, uh, the 12 that we're going to hear tonight, as well as the three from the school children. Um, looking forward to uh, sharing those with you as well. But I'm going to begin with a few poems of my own. I'm only going to read three poems of my own, short poems, and then the rest of the poems that I'll read tonight are by other people, which is always really pleasurable, actually, to read poems that you love uh, aloud, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so I went to college, uh, sixth form college, in the 1990s, which I would say is a historical period <laughs> now. Um, it's still when I hear like 1984, I think that's just the other day, but of course uh, it's, not <laughs> it's not just the other day. Um, I went to do my A-levels. I, I left a very dusty, traditional uh, secondary school where we seem to have only read Thomas Hardy 
to go to the local FE college. I actually wasn't allowed into the sixth form of my school. I might tell you why if you ask me later. Uh, and um, off I went to college where I met two teachers, both called John, John Toulon, John McDermott. And uh, the book is dedicated to John Toulon, the most kind of radical and inspiring English teachers. And I'm sure lots of people at home and here have had a teacher um, or maybe have, have a teacher to come that has really changed their lives. So certainly both Johns did that, particularly John Toulon. So the first poem, I'll read, um, I'll read two poems that are kind of almost like love poems, I guess, to, to John, who died uh, very young, um, shortly after I left sick form. Um, so the first book that he gave us uh, to read at A-Level English was Entezaki Shange's for coloured girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. And even by today's standards, it's a radical book. It's a poem that is set to dance, a long extended poem about black women's experiences um, in America. And it just blew my mind. And I think it blew the mind of all the kids sat next to me in at the FE College in Dagenham in Essex. Um, and that's the title of the poem, For Coloured Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough. Our vows were as flat as the dead fish that floated in Dagenham docks, but still John made us recite these lines meant for black women who said, I have poems, big thighs, little tits, which made us blush as our estuary tongues went tripping over cuz and enough, and the slashes the poet scattered over her page. And the whole bloody thing might well have been staged on another planet, compared to Essex and my pals, whose mum served up school dinners, whose dad worked nights at Ford's. We could just make out the half-rubbed words of last year's kids, discourse, nationhood, and soon I'd borrowed in my own new terms, hegemony, resistance, sisterhood. Um, and the second poem is uh, also about John. And I think at that age, you know, at 16, I think I was so inspired by him that I sort of mistook my being inspired for a crush. You know, I, that's the only way I could translate it. But it wasn't, if it was a crush, it was a, a literary sort of cerebral crush. But I wasn't aware at 16 there was any other kind of crush other than those that we were all having on, you know, the other 16-year-old boys. Pink Hummingbird. The postcard he sent to you that long, wet summer had on one side a pale pink hummingbird and overleaf his notes on your essay on Faulkner in his usual turquoise ink, the words you imagined written in sunlight on the bed of his book stuffed flat and each weighed with care like a love letter, though it was you that wanted him. All summer you waited for September to be back in the tattered classroom, the tables pushed together, and John at the top, like a doting father, or a bridegroom, or like God, if God wore Dr. Martin's shoes and a silver sleeper in one ear, not the God you didn't believe in, but one who believed in you. And then I'll finish by reading a poem um, they're also set in the same year, it would have been 90, I can't remember if it was 93 or 94, but it was the same year that I went to sixth form college, which is the same year I got really politicised, the same year I fell in with um, the anti-Nazi league and began to go on political demos and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was just around the time, just after the murder of Stephen Lawrence and uh, there was a march, a big march, uh, some of you may remember, to shut down the British National Party bookshop. And it was the first demo that I'd ever been in on. And there were 70,000 people and we were right at the front and it turned quite nasty. And I remember uh, watching the news report that night when I got home, when I finally got home and thinking, wow, like there's such a discrepancy between what the news is saying and what I uh, experienced. So sometimes a poem, you know, as well as all the other things it can be, it can be a version, a testimony, a historical account. Um, the poem's called Welling, 1993. On the news that night, they called us violent youth. But what I remember is the green cord jacket I was wearing pulled from a bargain bin that morning and a busload of us singing our way down south. The yellow placards like a bobbing sea of lollipops, 
a beautiful man with dreadlocks, studs in his chin, and us on the front line, marching and chanting, until the chanting suddenly stopped. Then one voice shouted, police protect the Nazis. The police, like a wall of giant flies, their graceful white horses, then silence. No moment in my life do I remember quieter. Before the charges, the bricks, the screams, two boys with gashed heads running together, that animal smell, red smoke, blood on my sleeves. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to introducing the entries from the, uh, the, the schools. Um, two schools submitted um, poems, and it was my pleasure to read them. And um, one of the school pupils is here tonight, Phoebe Kay, so it's my pleasure to welcome her to the stage to read her poem. Phoebe's from Bay Star Academy, and I'll let her tell you the title of the poem. And I'm going to sit down while you read, Phoebe, and then I'll bob back up to read the others. So my poem is called Women's Fight and it's a historical um, account on how the suffragette movement helped us women to have votes. In midst of history's pages, where tales of courage are written, a page about women's rights, but not one remembered, their lives hidden. In shadows of inequality, hope emerged, a collection of voices strong and fierce, from a silence they soon surged. They marched with banners held up high through streets their steps echoing, demanding justice, equality, sharing their thoughts, bellowing. So let this poem be a tribute to the brave women of old who paved the path to equality with their stories forever told. For women's rights they fought, though our journey is far from complete, will carry their torch until every woman stands on equal feet. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Phoebe. That was beautifully read. And I'm going to read the two other school entries that I uh, selected. Um, one is from Jasmine. Oh, they're both from, actually, from Ripley St. Thomas Secondary School. And the first one is by Jasmina Kvalska. And I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, especially if she's watching. Um, and it's just titled December the 16th, 2011. I was born in Poland. Three. I moved to England, four, my first day at nursery, five, my first day in primary school, I was as happy as the sun, 11, my last day at primary school, said goodbye to all my friends, it was sad like a rainy day, summer had lots of fun, summer sadly ended, 11, my first day at high school, made lots of new friends and now I see what happens next. And then finally, uh, also from um, Ripley, St. Thomas School, uh, Ava Lowe. I just wondered, just wondered if we might be related distantly. Um, uh, his poem, Lancaster History. First is the castle, standing tall and high, the dungeons as dark as night. Then it's the witches' trials, which were a dread. Witches would be hanged until they were dead. The Ashton Memorial is a beautiful building, as tall as a giant, its light in the night is gleaming. A hop, skip and a jump, that's all it takes to enjoy your time up in the lakes. Lancaster is great, there's nothing to hate. If you stay here, it may be your fate. <laughs> I thought it was lovely. Okay, wow, it's still like more of me <laughs> on the programme, but it's... A it's a short poem. So um, I was asked to read a few poems um, that are historical or speak to the theme of histories in some way. So I thought I would read to you a poem that I really love. If anyone was here earlier, I spoke about how when I was sort of being galvanised uh, into my love for poetry, it was through teaching poetry. I was teaching a thousand years of English poetry to some 16 year olds who were not that interested. <laughs> and um, I remember I really fell in love with this poem. Um, and I think it's, it's an ecological poem, you know, written many years ago. Um, but it's very much about what we're, you know, it's very relevant to what's going on with the climate emergency now. It's God's Grandeur by Gerald Manny Hopkins. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out 
like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is smeared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, and though the last lights of the black west went, a morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and our bright wings. I'm now going to introduce the first set of uh, readers um, uh, from the kind of adult selection of poems that speak in some way to the theme of histories. I'm going to read them in like sets of three so that um, I don't have to keep bobbing up to do introductions. So we're going to hear um, some by video, uh, two by video, one in person from Kerry Derbyshire, who lives in the Lake District, Francesca Street, um, who is here, I believe, who may be operating under a pseudonym, <laughs> um, and from, something mysterious, and from uh, Sam Kemp, who I think is based in London, but maybe American from um, their bio, I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, presumably this is all going to happen without me having to do anything. Is it? It's <laughs> all going to happen. Do I have to let yeah, okay. my ankles okay. off? Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kerry, and um, I'm very pleased to be reading my poem, Rising, tonight. And thank you so much, Hannah, for choosing it. Apologies for not being with you in person, but I know you'll have a lovely evening. Here's my poem, Rising. So foolish was I and ignorant. Psalms 73, 22, 28. Tell them about the dream, Mahalia Jackson shouted from the crowd that hot August day in 1963. The summer we northern girls wore mother-made cotton frocks, wandered hay meadows, fern hirelings, rain-wet woods, dreaming of becoming secretaries and mothers. There's nothing I can say you don't already know about Martin Luther King, the evening of April the 4th, 1968, or George Wallace standing on the steps of the state capitol in his hickory striped trousers declaring, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. With only radios to while away evenings of shipping forecasts and Mrs. Dale's diary, how were we to know that on the other side of the world, families were slaves to a land of separation, barriers built on iron ignorance, deep-rooted hate spreading like oil over dry land? We lived on milk and honey, Thomas Hardy, Wordsworth, Laurie Lee. We weren't afraid, could play out, sit anywhere on the bus. That day, I watched my mother cry for the Baptist preacher, the new Messiah delivering his speech to the world. I prayed for my unborn children, learned fear, found the parched places in the wilderness, in salt land and not inhabited. I learned, and he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, the earth shall rise. Yet still, brothers and sisters were drowning in stolen breath, ignored breath, pounding shores, sinking like salt into open wounds that stung the tongues of James Baldwin, Billie Holiday, Mayor Angelou, Margaret Walker, Martin Luther King, George Floyd. Tsunamis of prayer, faith, hope, rising, rising, and now I am old, still rising. 
Thank you very much. Hello, I'm the mysterious Francesca. My real name's Emma. I just use pseudonyms because I get nervous about submitting under my own name, um, which is normal, right? Uh, this poem is about the Blitz. I don't feel very qualified to write about the Blitz. Um, so you can do what you like with that information. But it's also about that kind of weird thing when like big earth changing sort of seismic things happen and like your life's changed forever, but also you get up the next morning and you make your Weetabix and you get the bus to work. Like all those things keep happening. So that's what I'm trying to get at in this poem. And I'll try not to wave my hands around too much as I read it. So this is called Debris. Coventry, 1940. In this city, there are more bricks than people. And if you run fast enough, you can taste it. Cold, thin gaps of senile air where buildings ought to be. Missing teeth. And we rattle around these ruins, we do. Humans, humans, trying to be. In this city, there are more buses than people. Each day along the roads, driverless, unmoored, a season ticket from somewhere to somewhere, nowhere to go, nowhere to be. In this city, there are more people than people. Eyes dark like apple seeds, two quiet hearts, not human humans, trying to be, picking across the debris. Passing through after the Luddite Rebellion of 1812. Tomorrow and today, like the tale of a comet-lit secret, counting Huddersfield's dark hours of labour and bribing the morning around guarded mills, iced with machine blood. Do lock the door after us, sir, this is the wealth of cotton. Enoch's hammer singing in two-handed brotherly arcs. But we're all just passing through, sir. The burning, the burnt, the stars, billion violences, and the hunger flowing through your hands like starlight as you shatter the elbows and knees of every machine in sight. Um, I think um, I'm sort of punctuating these sort of sets of poems by reading um, other poems by uh, writers. And I thought I'd read to you a poem that I love so much called The Trees Are Down by Charlotte Mew. And I, it was nice today to, I thought I'd better find out a bit more about Charlotte Mew. Because I've known the poem for years, but I actually don't know much about her. But I actually found she, she died, you know, she, was, she, she took her own life um, and suffered from... Uh, mental illness and much of her life and there was lots of trouble with money and looking after her family and so very difficult life. Uh, the poem was published in 1928 but she, she died in 1927 um, so I'm not sure when this poem was written but it's about the loss of a tree, about hearing a tree being cut down or trees being cut down outside the window and it always makes me think that trees are also kind of historical, uh, they're historical beings, they outlive us you know if we let them. And they are, they are historical witnesses, I think, as well. So uh, it's always a tragedy when a tree is cut down. The trees are down. They're cutting down the great plane trees at the end of the gardens. For days there's been the grate of the saw, the swish of the branches as they fall, the crash of the trunks, the rustle of trodden leaves, with the whoops and the woers, the loud common talk, the loud common laughs of the men above it all. I remember one evening of a long past spring, turning in at a gate, getting out of a cart and finding a large dead rat in the mud of the drive. I remember thinking, alive or dead, a rat was a godforsaken thing. But at least in May, that even a rat should be alive. The week's work here is as good as done. There is just one bow on the roped bowl in the fine grey rain, green and high and lonely against the sky, down now. And but for that, if an old dead rat did once for a moment unmake the spring, 
I might never have thought of him again. It is not for a moment that spring is unmade today. These were great trees. It was in them from root to stem. When the men with the whoops and the woers have carted the whole of the whispering loveliness away, half the spring, for me, will have gone with them. It is going now, and my heart has been struck with the hearts of the plains. Half my life it has beat with these in the sun, in the rains, in the March wind, the May breeze, in the great gales that came over to them across the roofs from the great seas. There was only a quiet rain when they were dying. They must have heard the sparrows flying, and the small creeping creatures in the earth where they were lying. For I all day I heard an angel crying, hurt not the trees. Okay, <laughs> and we'll move on to our second set of readers. We're going to hear oh, two people in person from Kristin Mears, um, uh, from Kim Russell and from Alice Evans. So let's all give them a, a welcome and I'll take my seat again. I come from a room which lies three miles and twenty years away. My mother is young there, tinged gold with midsummer, and alive even as her insides spill over the table. It is the shortest night of the year and the first of our lives. Through the window are stars we don't know the names of yet, and a city will grow up in. But this is a time before time, the moment before the Big Bang. And I am in a smaller world of darkness, muffled water, six hands and thirty fingers, thirty toes. I don't know where my body ends and theirs begin, limbs tangled, shapes shapeless. Soon I'll wake up, alarm ringing, bundled into towels and noise and a world to find my place in. But for now, it is huge and I am small, bumping against seaweed, against sleep against the wine-red wall and three beating hearts. It is the night before my birthday, and I don't even know it. I dream of nothing, my hand open. I haven't heard music yet. It is an hour before these nebulous things around me become a brother, sister, father, mother. Hello, my name's Kim M. Russell. I'm from North Norfolk, and my little poem is a personal history, a list poem entitled Mother's Eyes. I am coaty powder on her cheek, peach lipstick imprints on a tissue, softness of her favourite sweater, waft of her chiffon scarf, neat handwriting in a discovered letter, slim ankles tucked under a chair, secrets she never revealed, imperfections always concealed, wrinkled hands freckled and dry, the blue of my mother's eyes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alice Evans and I'm going to read a poem called After Winter. After winter, standing in the doorway, you, my love, are my hearth and my heart. The sun is warm. Cracked windows take my breath. We pour water. We come, we go. I leave you as you are gently folded, you, my horizon, skyline perfect. I'm in from the cold. Thank you very much. Gosh, I'm like a jack in the box. <laughs> um, 
Oh, I'm going to read a sad one. Um, I, I was thinking about this theme of history. It's such a broad theme, isn't it? And of course, um, we've heard poems tonight, uh, myself and others, about sort of personal histories and then public, you know, po public big sort of uh, poems that about you know address war and uh, you know that seem to be very public but can also be very personal. And I think Edward Thomas, um, who was a, a Welsh poet, was such a a brilliant poet, a sort of war, considered a war poet, but wrote so personally about the effects of war. And of course, he was killed in 1917 in the Battle of Arras, um, and when he'd only been, uh, you know, for, um, enrolled in, for a few months. Uh, and this poem was written in 1916, um, in the third month of the Battle of the Somme. It's called "Gone, Gone Again." Gone, gone again. May, June, July and August gone, again gone by. Not memorable, save that I saw them go, as past the empty quays the rivers flow. And now again in the harvest rain, the Blenheim oranges fall grubby from the trees, as when I was young, and when the lost one was here, and when the war begun to turn young men to dung. Look at the old house, outmoded, dignified, dark and untenanted, with grass growing instead on the footsteps of life, <coughs> the friendliness, the strife, in its beds have lain youth, love, age and pain. I am something like that, only I am not dead, still breathing and interested in the house that is not dark. I am something like that, not one pain, to reflect the sun, for the schoolboys to throw at. They have broken every one. Um, I'm now going to introduce um, three more poems, all by video, from Kelly Davis, Lizette Abrahams and Cora Greenhill. Good evening everyone, I'm Kelly Davis. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I'm delighted to be able to join you virtually. Thanks so much to Hannah Lowe for selecting my poem for tonight's gala reading. I live in Maryport, a little town on the West Cumbrian coast. I moved here from London 35 years ago, and my poem is about Maryport Civic Hall which was demolished in 2009. The Civic Hall has gone. Where its square bulk once stood, there are well-designed apartments. Flats are needed and wanted, but the Civic Hall has gone. Mums and dads used to queue to see their kids in amateur operatic shows. Nervous, sweaty teenagers smoked outside heavy metal gigs. Middle-aged blues fans were seduced by soaring guitars. The local legend who raised vast sums at her Remembrance Day concerts, she's gone too. Once known as the Palace Ballroom, our Civic hosted Herman's Hermits, the Animals, the Searchers, the Hollies, Lulu. But the post-war concrete was cracking. The roof needed maintaining. Not surprising, the council accountants thought it was no longer fit for purpose. Must be replaced by a smaller building. The day it went, our town's shoulders slumped a little lower. Hello, my name is Lisette and I work for the NHS as a substance misuse specialist. In my spare time, I write flash fiction and poetry. Unfortunately, because I live so far away in Surrey, I'm unable to be with you in person, but thank you for inviting me to pre-record this for you. My writing is often an attempt to find the personal within the historical. It could be that I hear an interview or read an account of a, a historical event and one image, 
description or idea will stay with me and form the basis of a piece of writing. And so with this poem, inspired by a description I heard in an interview with a man, now in his 80s, who recounted how he had been sent to the Pacific when he was 17 to undertake his national service, with no idea of what he was going to be asked to do. While he was there, he was called up on deck and asked to hold his hands tightly over his eyes. Then an atom bomb was detonated and the flash was so bright that he saw the bones in his hands lit up like an X-ray. It was the horror of this image that stayed with me and that I mention in this poem. The man had been sent to the Pacific as part of Operation Grapple, and this was a series of British nuclear weapons tests of hydrogen and atomic bombs that took place in 1957 and 1958 at Morden Island and Christmas Island in the Pacific Ocean. In 1955, Prime Minister Anthony Eden was warned in a report that if scientists were to test these bombs, the nuclear radiation could have a disastrous effect on the troops' health and their genes. His comment was, a pity, but we cannot help it. And this is also the name of my poem. A pity, the Prime Minister said, but we cannot help it. Cannot help it that Dad, age 17, wide-eyed and green, with a thousand others like him, all young, all fit, all keen, jumped on a coastbound train and didn't look back. Cannot help it that these boys went off on waves of excitement, with family ties loosened, clothes and friendships outgrown, glad to be the ones to go, the birds that had flown, to trade dull grey English towns for blue Pacific Ocean. Cannot help it that Christmas Island was so bright and golden that sunlight and the swift dart of silver fish dazzled their eyes, that the pink coral reefs and warm salt waves seemed like paradise to boys raised in the cold of shared tin baths in small winter yards. Cannot help it that Dad was down below when ordered up, that he rushed onto the deck in just his sandals, shorts and shirt, to learn that he and his crewmates were about to be the first to see a sight so wonderful that it would never leave them. Cannot help it that the men were only 12 miles from the blast, that they were told to clench their fists, then hold them over their eyes, that Dad recalls seeing, through tightly squeezed eyelids, surprised, a bright flash light up the bones of his fingers like an X-ray. Cannot help it that the crew stood stock still as a dark cloud formed, a strange, unsettling cloud hanging low on the horizon, that they watched with growing dread as the cloud blocked out the sun. Black rain fell and dead fish floated to the surface of the sea. Cannot help it that they swallowed the water and breathed the air, netted the catch, that the black rain is still falling on those men, that the dark cloud forms in Dad's head again and again, and that he can't stop the dead fish from floating to the surface. Cannot help it that what they saw that day has never left them, that it blights their nights and steals their days, that it lives inside them, eating away, shortening their lives and those of their children, their legacy, born limbless, sightless, sickly, weak, the fallout. Cannot help it that they didn't know the risks when they set off. Risks that the scientists noted in reports sent to the man who had the final say, who had the power to halt the plans. A pity, the Prime Minister said, but we cannot help it. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great evening.
Hello, I'm Cora Greenhill. Um, thank you very much to Hannah for inviting me to read my poem, and I'm really sorry I can't be with you tonight. Um, my poem's set in Crete, where I was lucky enough to um, spend quite a lot of my working life, but um, we usually think of Crete as, as sunny and gorgeous, which it often is, but uh, this poem is a rather gloomy poem about uh, climate change and mismanagement in Europe, um, which we're all too familiar with. Um, behind me here, 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 I have my Cretan goddess, who's doing her best to save us all. Um, and is a uh, yeah, great, great person for me. Um, so the poem is called A Continental Split. Crete. March 2019. Those storms have left their devastating downward pull on these faces in Mitsos Taverna, where families warm their hands on souvlaki pitters. The stove smokes, a wet tongue of wind chill in its chimney. Outside, battered lilies bruised petals of white iris, flattened freesias. Boulders and red clay piled on the sides of roads, those that weren't quite swept away. Seven bridges have come down. Will Europe help? Imposed austerity led to catastrophe. Our parliament votes again on how to leave. The cracks are widening across the continent I've just crossed. Its icy peaks and islands still asleep. Thank you. Okay, also I'm going to read the last poem, you know, by someone else, uh, which is a poem by Langston Hughes. I'm sure some of you know about Langston Hughes, who was an Afro-American writer and activist uh, born in, I think, 1900. Um, and this poem uh, is one that I really love, and it was written way before the Civil Rights Movement uh, in 1940. It's called Daybreak in Alabama. When I get to be a coloured composer, I'm going to write me some music about Daybreak in Alabama. And I'm going to put the pertiest songs in it, rising out of the ground like a swamp mist and falling out of the heaven like soft dew. I'm going to put some tall, tall trees in it and the scent of pine needles and the smell of red clay after rain and long red necks and poppy coloured faces and big brown arms and the fields daisy eyes of black and white, black, white, black people. And I'm going to put white hands and black hands and brown hands and yellow hands and red clay earth hands in it, touching everybody with kind fingers, touching each other natural as dew in that dawn of music when I get to be a coloured composer and write about daybreak in Alabama. Old Langston Hughes, an amazing writer. And now that brings us to our last uh, three um, uh, readers tonight on the theme of histories. And we're going to hear from Simone Manson Broom, I hope I've pronounced your name right, um, from Mary L. Walsh and Elizabeth Gilbert. very very vertically challenged so I'm hoping it's going to sort of stay like that. Um, hi, uh, this evening I feel slightly embarrassed that the poem that has been selected is not um, one of my political poems. Um, it's not about suffragettes or women's rights or war or anything else although I do write about all of those things. It's actually quite a little personal narrative poem and it's called On St David's Day. We wake to snow, 
A dusting brushing the earth around the daft, sparkling as the sun climbs, melts it, mumbles about spring's arrival, seeming confused but hopeful. And later, after walking the dogs, forgetting my gloves, watching my breath spiral skywards, the grandson pops by, waggles his loose tooth obligingly, tells me about the trip. They've just got back. An hour away, maybe more. I ask where? What for? For singing, he says, in a church. No, not a church. Bigger than a church, but also beginning with k. A kicking k. Cathedral. Yes, that's it, he says. St David's Cathedral. Singing with the school. Loads of kids. Reindeer antlers on his hat bob to and fro as he points out the wobbly tooth once more, canters off. He is not sure why they went. No one was sick this time. The coach was fun anyway. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Walsh. I'm sorry I can't be with you this evening. I hope you have a wonderful night. And thank you, Hannah, for choosing my poem, An Irish Childhood in Dagnum. I'll read it for you now. Step dancing on Saturday. Saturday morning, once again, in our pumps, black elastic burrowing, furrowed brows, tongues between teeth, Dust motes circling the musty air. Grubby, sweaty, smelly, red cheek kids, fidgety, in a basement classroom, St Peter and Paul's Ilford. Get the 25 bus and get off at the Palais. Mum tucks money in pocket and mind the road. Irish step dancing classes, the Eddie Hickey School. His looks escape me now. I have the sense of a heavy shortage set man. In a line of concentrated twitchiness, we start the reel. Hop one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hop one, two, three, hop one, two, three. He doesn't have a record player, rather mouths the music, puss music, Dad called it. Hop one, two, three. My cousin cries each week. No join it for him, a cultural nightmare wrapped in bad timing. We persevere, progressing to the jig. Kick, hop back, hop one, two, three, four. Not ready for the hornpipe, wrong shoes. Relegated to the stark, unyielding bench, we sit smirking and poking at each other. Till Eddie Hickey shouts, a step dancing teacher who doesn't shout, is a rare article. Plain dancing, ramrod straight back, arms by our sides with pointed toes, left over from the crossroad dances and kitchen coleys. We are from Dagnum, Ireland. Thank you very much. Hi. It's really lovely to be here, and I'm really happy to have my poem chosen. Um, it's set in Salamanca in Spain, where I lived. I realised recently, because I was working out, that it was nine years ago, which kind of blows my mind as to how long ago it was. It was when I was at university, I did some study abroad there. Um, and Salamanca is kind of like the Oxford of Spain. It's got a really old university and it's really kind of... it's The whole city is like a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so everything is really old. And sometimes it can feel so kind of intense and like you're stuck in a different world. Um, and it's also really, really hot. Um, and the symbol of the city is a frog. And a frog can also be a symbol of queerness because frogs transform and they're also just a little bit different. So all of that kind of came together and the poem is called Frog Summer. Once a girl took a plane and a train and then a taxi. 
to ride past dry fields, under a dry sky, to a frog city. In Salamanca, she found an inky wet dusk, swirling with swallows and bats. She reached her dorm, San Vicente, tucked up a side street in the old town. She was shown to her bed and she slept, the shutter down. Next day she ate small square buns for breakfast, then weaved past flower baskets, yellow post boxes, golden stone, cats and dogs curled on balconies, heavy storks nesting in the Anaya Palace chimneys. She went to classes in Spanish language and art and history, ate her lunches alone in the shade. Pisto con huevo, courgette gratin, cinnamon rice. She would later take the recipes home for Mam to try. At night, she went to the Plaza Mayor to see the dancers, hear the tunas with their accordions and drums and guitars. The air was cooler then, but she ate ice cream, caramel and mint. She went to stand and squint at the Casa Lise, its green glass glowing like an oblong angel on the hill. She looked up for Leo in the dark and found something else that she'd never seen, like Scorpio but with one more star. She huddled against thunderstorms that shook the walls and wondered why she couldn't find room for love for one of the handsome boys from Buenos Aires. She imagined a girl holding her, caring. She stumbled into a little art shop. It smelled of pencils and hope. And she bought a pad and so many colours. At her desk, she drew women's faces over and over. Possibly not. Thank Thank you. Well, that brings us to um, nearly the end of tonight's uh, gala reading. And, you know, my heartfelt thanks to all the poets that read tonight in person, who sent their videos, and also just everyone that um, sent in a poem for the, you know, of the 128 poets that sent in, and as well, um, Phoebe. Thanks so much for coming uh, tonight and reading. It's really wonderful to hear you and to all the other um, school students. Um, I'm going to hand back to Bill shortly, but I thought I would finish with a poem which is on page 23, as I thought, yeah. And uh, it's a poem about, um, well, it's about my days as a teacher, which are historical now, because I left teaching in 2012. Um, but it's also about uh, the theatre, uh, taking uh, to see old plays. So we used to take our sixth form students to see Shakespeare plays, you know, get a job lot of quite cheap tickets at the National, the Barbican sometimes. And um, some of the students I taught are, you know, had been to the theatre with their parents, they're familiar with the theatre, and other students had never been to the theatre before, so it was a whole new experience for them. And I used to say to them things that, you know, that you could get ice cream in the interval and stuff, but it was quite expensive, so they might want to bring something to eat. And I remember once I took a load of students to see Twelfth Night, and in the interval, they'd taken it so literally, they were pulling out boxes of, like Tupperware boxes of fried chicken, Massive bags of Doritos, two litres of Tango, it's just hilarious. Um, and I had so many fun experiences taking these kids to the theatre. But we took 80 students to see Othello at the Donmar Warehouse with Ewan McGregor. And it was so, there was only two teachers because of staff sickness. And probably you'd never get away with that now because of risk assessment. Uh, my colleague, who is anonymous in, in the epigraph, said this is more like bloody dog walking than teaching. <laughs> So I took the dog idea and ran with that. The sixth form theatre trip. You've got more dogs than you can count. Big dogs and small. One badass dog in headphones mooching up the aisle. A dog who smuggled in a hot dog. Two loving dogs, back row, already smooching. 
Some dogs are up on haunches, barking, a dog or two already dozing, heads in paws, dog sighing and dreaming. The other theatre dogs look down their snouts, a pair of tutting chow chows, some slony poodles in the box. But when the curtains lift and your dogs are hypnotised, their ears like little hoisted sails, the wag of tails, their shining dog hearts fling wide open. They know these words, these lines, memorised like buried bones. And don't you love your dogs? Okay. <laughs> Well, that really does bring us to the end. So, Hannah, your, if only your, um, your students knew how much you missed them. But I think the students you never taught will definitely have definitely lost out. Um, thank you, everyone, um, online and in the auditorium. Thank you especially to the poets who contributed and to all the poets who submitted poems. Um, it means that there's now something like 140 poems on our digital map for this year with dots scattered across the world depending on where the poem sat or where it came from. So this has been um, both a digital and an in-person um, uh, project and um, it will be there for a long time to come. And the recording, if you want to look at it again when you get home, is um, uh, will be up for um, certainly for 30 days. Uh, and then we'll have to review at that point. So all I need to say now is that um, Hannah's books are on sale outside, along with the other poetry books from which poets read today. And to um, thank you all for coming and to say as you go, please um, help Litfest to carry on doing the kind of work it's doing, which is bringing poets to read and novelists and um, historians, but also making and creating projects and poetry here in the Northwest. Um, and also, if any of you did manage to see the wonderful exhibition upstairs, that's another aspect of what we do. All of that couldn't happen without you being involved and without your donations. So on the way out, there will be a bucket into which you can pour your loose change or even those unwanted um, 10 pound notes or fivers. And on the seats is a little um, leaflet called the Litfus um, Friends Scheme where you can spread your donation in small amounts over a year because however small those, those donations help us to do the things that we do working with kids in schools as well as with um, poets in the room, novelists, historians, memoir writers, and so on. So um, thank you all very much indeed. And please join me once more in a round of applause for Hannah Lowe and the poets she chose to read tonight.